Greetings, viewers and listeners. This is Tittle Tattle, and this is Marian, your host. Welcome back to the concluding part of episode two of Did You Know This? which is on striving for a successful career in STEM. In today's conversation, we will be discussing career planning, career development, and how to have work-life balance in order to attain the ultimate success and joy that we all desire. Stick and stay. So career planning is a process in which personal skills, qualities, knowledge, interests and other characteristics of the individual are documented systematically for actualization and it usually will involve the selection of career goals and the path to these goals so there's the need for the individual to acquire information about job opportunities the qualification that is required and the choices that are needed to be made specific goals are set also throughout this process to serve as a blueprint or a draft for achieving the milestones at specific timelines. Under career planning, there are three key areas of consideration. First is the exploration process or the point of discovery and identification. So the individual has done a program in either of the same fields, but you will have to decide that if I want to be in industry, if I want to be in academia, if I want to be in policy and then you look for information in that field so that's the exploration process talking to people who are hiring in the respective fields or even practitioners in the fields to get a fair idea of what happens there and that leads to discovery and then identification of the niche of your peculiar interest and then after exploration you go to goal setting and then you, after you have set your goals, then you go to action planning. I'll take these step by step and then walk us through. So exploration, identification, and discovery step. The things you need to do in order to have this done effectively is to be aware of what your personality type will help you achieve. So what is your personality type and how does that influence your choice? of career. First, you need to ask yourself the questions. What motivates and interests you? What do you find fulfilling? What are your values and priorities? For example, some people, their value is to make money. Some is to contribute to society and make an impact. Some is to raise a family. So you need to be aware of these things. Every individual is different. That is why we went through a process of introspection during the first section. And then after you've gone through your values and priorities, what are your skill sets? What are the skills you have? What are the things you're good at? Writing skills, documenting, filing, accounting. These will come in handy, so you need to put them down and decide on what you ultimately use these skills for as a job or during your career. What job settings best fit these things that you have outlined which are coming out of your personality type and your set skills once you have done that then you're on your way to set goals goals and career planning are supposed to be smart smart meaning specific measurable attainable relevant and time bound so if the goals are specific then you have to make sure that they can be achieved within a particular um, space. So for example, if you are doing a BSc in chemistry and you want to do a master's in chemistry, then you can set a goal that if you are in the final year, then you can set a goal that by the year 2025, I want to have an, a master's degree in chemistry. So this is very specific. You want to have a master's degree in chemistry measurable how are you going to measure that the only way of measuring that is to hold a certificate in masters in chemistry so that is how you measure that attainable 2025 is very attainable because if i'm final year now you use one year for national service that is 2022 two years will be 2024 so an extra on top two 
make room for any unforeseen circumstances. So yes, it's attainable because the average student completes a master's in two years. Is it relevant? Yes, it's relevant if you want to use a master's in chemistry either to teach or to work in a research lab or an industry. Then you, if you do analytical chemistry, then you work in an analytical lab. Then that is relevant to your goals. If you do organic chemistry and you do natural products, for example, where you are harnessing plants uh, and other natural resources for medicinal value, and you work, you, your ultimate goal is to work in the pharmaceutical industry, then that is relevant. Is it time bound? The T is time bound. Yes, it's time bound because you've told yourself that you want to attain a master's by 2025. So this is how you set realistic goals and using the SMART acronym. Then we go to the last stage of career planning, which is action planning. Action planning simply means making a list or a chart of tasks that needs to be carried out or done in order to achieve the set career goals. So be conscious about it. Make a list. And the list should include timelines so that you can be your own um, assessor along the way. Now, this diagram shows you a sample action plan. And it's designed for undergraduate students who, I presume, have not worked before. So your action plan, when you come to the first year, the first thing you do, you are coming from the high school. You need to consciously rewind <laughs> and calibrate your mind to know that this is a new phase and you're no longer in the high school. So create a review, smart affirmation, goal setting statement yourself. You can tell yourself that I'm going to be the best astrologist in the next five years. That is an affirmative statement, which is also smart in the sense that Astrologist is specific, and then the last one, time bound, you said in the next five years. So you set these SMART goals, which are also motivating you to achieve them, and then you need to explore your interests, your majors. If your program is such that you have areas of specialization, or what we call electives in Ghana, then you need to speak with your academic tutor or course advisor to help you choose the right electives, which will be in line with your ultimate goals that you need to achieve. And then also you need, again, to discuss the specific resources available in order to achieve these goals. So speak with your lecturers, speak with your course advisors, get the necessary advice. They have walked the path before. They will be able to show you where to find the needed information and resources in order to achieve your set goals. And then transition from high school to college, as I have said. <laughs> so start drawing your CV. If you don't have a CV, start building one. And most younger people at the university, the only information they have on their CV is their bio data and then their educational background because they haven't done much in terms of work. But this is a time to be conscious about it so that you do what you must do in order to get information on your CV. And then create social media platforms that are professionally related and activate them from time to time as you make progress. So LinkedIn, ResearchGate, and so on and so forth, so that you are noticed. And then when the time comes for you to look for a job, employers would have seen your history and it will make them more comfortable hiring you than hiring an invisible person, someone who has no web presence. If you don't have any web presence, it's a red flag. Sometimes employees might think you have done something bad and you have intentionally cleaned all traces of what you might have done. So this is what you need to do in your first year of undergrad. I'm working with the intention of on the assumption that all of you listeners and viewers are doing a four year undergraduate program. In the second year, you should sign up for internship. And even in Ghana and elsewhere, most undergrads do their internship in the second year. So avail yourself to that opportunity. Sign up to do an internship in a field, again, which is related to your goals. With that experience, you'll be able to update your CV. You can take up leadership roles on campus. 
either in your student unions or even if no one is voting for you to occupy a position, you can volunteer to work either in the library, either in the community reading to children in deprived areas, visiting the needy, the elderly, and so on and so forth. Create opportunities for you to build a CV if you don't get um, voted into office by your peers. Also, update your professional social media account as you go along with the new accomplishments, accomplishments so that your potential employer will see your growth. In your third year, at this time, you're getting close to the end, so you need to identify and participate in career fairs and other opportunities in your field, conferences. You could, again, update your CV along the way, update your social media profile. You can start practicing interviews at this point, maybe with your course advisor or academic tutor where you create a scenario and then you practice on interviews. And then if you have plans of going further beyond undergraduate, then you can develop a graduate school or a job search application strategy. And these are supposed to help you move to the next step. When you get to final year, then it means you are gradually getting to the end of the one phase of your life. And at this point, you need to identify and participate in more internships in your field, again, to build your capacity and your competency, attend career workshops and networking events in your field again, so that you speak with the relevant people and uh, movers and shakers in your field and make the right acquaintances. Again, any experiences acquired, you need to update your CV, update your social media profile, professional social media profile. Connect with professionals and peers that you have met at meetings or those you have discovered on social media. Reach out, don't be shy about these things. It's professionally related. There's nothing to be shy about. Meet with your career advisor or your academic tutor or your supervisor for more advice and also to help for them to help you review your documents if you have doubts. Again, ask for a mock interview and then complete it. And then at this point, if you had set any graduate school or job search strategies in the third year, this will be the time to implement them or start the implementation process. Yeah, so having gone through the stages of introspection and career planning, the next step is career development. And career development, just like in the design of a building, after the plan has been designed, the execution of what is on the plan is what we call the development stage. So career development goes through a period of establishment to the point of retirement, and we'll go through the steps one by one. So as I had indicated earlier, career development is a series of specific activities aimed at establishing, nurturing, and then enriching a career to success. And it will involve the personal improvements which the individual undertakes in order to achieve the career plan. And therefore, career development can be analyzed based on the career stages, which include also exploration, early career, mid-career, late career, and decline. Why exploration again at this point? Because it's a new phase. So for example, if you have moved from one job and you're thinking of entering another job, you will still have to explore, look at your options and how competitive you are on the market. If you have finished undergraduate and you're starting your first job, of course, exploration is important. If you went to school from a job and upgraded and coming back to the job market and not to your old or your previous job, there's still the need for exploration. So normally this is a period of either transition from the university or a period of changing jobs. And at this point, this is where you need to learn about the world of work if you are fresh and you have not worked before. You need to know how 
the work life is and how different that is from school or from being in school. And then after the exploration stage, you go to the establishment stage, which usually is referred to as early career. And that is usually between zero to seven years of your career, or even up to 10 years of your career. This is referred to as early career. Zero to seven years or up to 10 years postgraduate. And the start of one's first job, a new job after graduation, it comes under this uh, stage of career development. This is the time for learning and unlearning because you might have found yourself in a new environment and the skills and the attributes and traits acquired over there might not necessarily be transferable. So you will learn new things, you will unlearn old things. It's a time of uncertainties because you are entering a new field and you probably don't know what is expected of you. Therefore, it's important to know the environment. Study the environment, know what is required to stay afloat, know what is required to excel, know the work culture, and learn how to adapt. Once you have known the environment, you'll be able to create a niche for yourself. Identify an area where there is a gap where you could occupy and excel. In the process of doing all this, you need to find a mentor. You need to find someone already in the field to hold your hand, so to speak, and show you how things are done in the area. So you don't make a lot of avoidable mistakes. It's also a time to learn new skills. Example, if you are a scientist like myself and you are entering academia, it could be a time to set up your lab or to start thinking of setting up your lab and also a time to start thinking of grant writing or actually starting the process of grant writing. After every career, you move to mid-career, which is normally up to 20 years from your first job. And at the mid-career, you start achieving some of your goals. It's at this point that people start attaining promotions or getting promoted. People start seeing improvement in their performance and the tasks that they are assigned to. Some people even get assigned to new positions. At this point, you need to be conscious that you should also give back. So make a conscious effort to offer mentorship to other people who have come after you. At this stage of mid-career, high achievers or high flyers emerge and then some also plateau. But those who plateau are not necessarily less achievers. They are just average and they plateau. It can be very challenging for the those who are not high achievers because sometimes they might feel inadequate. Again, at mid-career, it's a time to learn new skills because new ways of doing things in your field might have emerged. For example, if you're into computer science, maybe some new software had come and your programming language, new ones might have come and you will have to learn these things, even though you are flying. Therefore, they don't have to impress anybody. The high achievers will move from more power positions, occupying positions, to positions of consultancy or consultancy roles more. At this point, the individual will have to be conscious about grooming a successor if you belong to an organization which believes in career progression. Because you get into the end and you need to be conscious about grooming a successor so that when you leave the scene, the whole is not created. At this stage of late career, low achievers go through an identity crisis because the average person assumes that after working for so many years, 
There are certain things they should be able to do. There are certain advice and direction they should be able to offer. But because they have not been able to achieve so much or occupy different positions, they might not be in a position to offer what is being asked or expected of them. And that is what brings about the identity crisis. Again, at this stage, you can still learn new skills and you should also start looking at other interests apart from work because gradually you are getting to retirement and you don't want your life to be built only around work. The next stage of career development is what is referred to as the decline stage, which is normally the, ten, the last 10 to 5 years before retirement. It can be very challenging for high flyers who have to leave the limelight because they have always been the center of attention and all of a sudden they have to recline to the backstage. However, it can be pleasant for low performers because it's like it's time to end the torture. <laughs> it's finally getting over. I'm not happy with this job. I'm not making any progress. So if I'm going to retire, it must be a good thing. But the best people or the people with the best feeling at this stage of their career is those who plateau, the who climb and then plateau. These people can easily adjust and switch to other activities because throughout their lives they were more or less balanced. For those who are healthy, they can take up new jobs, either paid or voluntary. And this is also the time to engage and build on other interests that were discussed in the previous stage of late career. Again, you need to start learning new things on how to prepare for retirement, both psychologically, physically, and emotionally, so that things don't take you on our words. This is a sample career development plan which I will present to you it's a template that you individually can look at and also design your own career development plan. After doing that, you can send me a question in a comment section or put your email down and then we can communicate by email if you want me to comment or have a look at your career development plan. So this uh, young man, Kwesi Kumi, Ghanaian, shows his past employment history and then his present position it shows his value systems after going through a time of introspection his competencies the skill sets that he brings to the table he's very honest to indicate that he is limited in certain ways and you all need to do that so that once you know your limitations you know how to work towards achieving them and then he sets up goals for short term, middle term, and then long term. Very beautiful template that you could use to develop your own career plan, development plan. Now that we have learned about ourselves, we have gone through introspection, we've gone through how to develop a career plan or how to design a career plan and how to design a career development plan Life will not be complete or worthwhile if it is not balanced. So I would like to share with you a few tips on work-life balance, which would be like the icing on the cake after you have done well at work. You need the mental and emotional health in order to enjoy the successes of your career. Now that we have gone through all the three stages of achieving a successful career, which includes a time of introspection, uh, career planning, and then career development planning, I would like to add a bit on work-life balance, which would be like the icing on the cake for all of us. After we have achieved so much at work, is it enough? Or do we need something else in order to attain the satisfaction, the contentment, and the true joy that we all aspire to. So now a bit about work-life balance. Work-life balance is the state of equilibrium where a person prioritizes the demands of one's career and the demands of one's personal life. Because as human beings, we are made up of spirit, soul, and body. That is, if you believe so, 
all these three entities will have to be satisfied we will have to be in tune with all these three entities in order to live life to the full and work-life balance is necessary for the mental and emotional health of each every individual so we Viewers and listeners, I hope you have been equipped with all the necessary tools you need in order to jump start your career if you have not worked before, and also to nurture and build your career if you're already on the trajectory. I hope to see you again next time. Thanks for watching.